Welcome to the Nemeth Report podcast. I'm Dr. Tammy Nemeth, historian and independent researcher, and I'll be your host. Europe is facing an energy crisis of its own making and is dragging the rest of the Western world with it. The UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and now the United States. For over a decade, Europe has been forcing an energy transition away from reliable, affordable and secure oil, natural gas and coal to an economy and society run on unreliable and insecure wind and solar energy. Reliable coal and nuclear power plants have been phased out, while more renewables have destabilized the European grid. Since renewable energy is so unreliable and is unable to produce the necessary amount of scalable and dispatchable energy to run a modern industrial technological society, European countries have relied upon natural gas from Russia to power backup energy plants and fuel industrial production. Russia's attack on Ukraine and the subsequent sanctions on Western Russian energy has left Europe reeling with staggering electricity price increases, nationalizations of power utilities, and proposed energy rationing. Not only that, European steel, aluminum, and other factories are shutting down due to the high energy costs, a process of deindustrialization and so-called decarbonization championed by supporters of the EU Green Deal and the global climate change movement. The citizens of the EU are poised to suffer through potential rolling blackouts, high energy prices, reduced mobility, higher food prices, and an abrupt drop in their standard of living. What is the response of the EU to this situation? The EU president has insisted it needs a change of paradigm to keep fossil fuels in the ground, to decarbonize more, build more unreliable windmills and solar panels, reduce overall energy demand, and change the way people travel, eat, and live. Where are the pilot projects demonstrating that a 100% renewable society can work? Where are the realistic cost-benefit analyses that demonstrate all of this suffering in Western countries will actually affect or influence global climate change? The EU commitment to decarbonization and this paradigm shift is shared by Canada and now the United States, though we aren't quite as far along the net zero transition as Europe. One must ask, do the citizens and their governments truly understand what net zero and this forced energy transition means, the sacrifices needed to achieve it in the name of slowing climate change, and if what's being proposed is even feasible or desirable. Here to speak with me today about some of the realities about renewables and the forced net zero energy transition is Francis Menton. Francis received a degree from Yale and a JD law degree from Harvard. He's a retired lawyer and was a partner at a New York law firm for more than 30 years. On his popular blog, Manhattan Contrarian, he writes about elite political ideologies on climate change, the purpose of government, New York State news, and the basic principles of economics. Thank you so much, Francis, for speaking with me today. You've been researching and writing about these issues for several years now. How did you become interested and concerned about these things? And what made you start your blog? I, I would say I got interested in the uh, climate change issue just by reading news accounts of it and and things in the press pro- promoting uh, renewables and promoting the idea of the coming a climate apocalypse, uh, as early as the 90s. And I recognized it then as something that was not a small thing. Uh, I I had a pretty good sense that most of the energy we use come from fossil fuels. And so the, the proposal here that was being tossed out rather cavalierly was a total transformation of how we produce and use energy without much idea how that was going to be done. But so I thought I ought to get on top of the issue, that I ought to read up on it, study up on it, become knowledgeable about it, because I thought it was important. It was clearly important. And I started doing that um, at least by 2000. Now, 2000 and 
Maybe I should go even back a little more. In, in 2001, I believe, is when the IPCC came out with what might have been its third, what so-called third assessment report that had the hockey stick graph on the on the cover and throughout it. That was the promotional uh, iconic image for uh, the coming climate apocalypse, showing showing the temperatures had been level for centuries, a millennium or more. And then suddenly shot up in the fossil fuel era in the 20th century, and that and that was pro produced in full color. It came out of a 1998 Nature article, which I had not read, but it was produced in full color in 2001, I believe, and by the IPCC. And after that, there was a guy named Steve McIntyre. I believe he's still out there. But he already in 2001 was a retired mining guy in Canada, but a very skilled mathematician. And, and, and by the way, when I looked at this hockey stick graph, and my career was as a litigator, and I looked at the hockey stick graph, and my immediate reaction was that that's a scam. Uh, there are various things about it were an obvious scam. Uh, which, which we can talk about more if you want. I, I thought it was uh, it was a very much a litigator's graph. It's a kind of graph I or my adversaries produce many times in um, litigation to uh, appear to prove a point uh, uh, when any with people with a skeptical eye could immediately see it wasn't real. Uh, but uh, shortly after that thing came out in 2001, this guy, Steve McIntyre, started taking it apart. And he had a website called Climate Audit. I don't remember how I came upon that, but uh, sometime around 2002 or 2003, I started reading that. He wrote multiple, multiple long articles of his efforts to get information out of the propounders of the hockey stick, um, which he wasn't able to do. They stonewalled him. They fought him tooth and nail. They called him all kinds of names. But gradually, and, and he was struggling to reproduce the hockey stick graph, which was very difficult to do and basically couldn't be done. And and over time, he, along with a colleague, Ross McKittrick, uh, produced a series of articles. I believe the first one of those was in 2003. There was another in 2005 that, that basically uh, showed the flaws in the fakery in the hockey stick. So I followed that all very closely during that period of time. I believe that 2009 or 10 was the time of the so-called climate gate emails that came out of um, the University of East Anglia, which is where a lot of the manipulated climate data comes from. <clears throat> and I followed that very closely also, as did McIntyre, and he had a blog called Climate Audit that all this was on. So if you read Climate Audit, you would be very on top of this, although Climate Audit requires a lot of uh, uh, mathematics. There's a lot of mathematics because McIntyre is a, is a mathematician and a very knowledgeable one. Well, I happen to have majored in math. Now, I'm not nearly as good a mathematician as McIntyre, but I can follow it. And, and uh, actually, there aren't all that many people who can follow it. Um, so that takes us up to about 2010. Uh, I was practicing law. I had a very demanding job, but um, we had a mandatory retirement at age 65. So that was <laughs> <laughs> that was 2015 for me. And then a couple of years before that, I was not working as hard as I had worked before. So I had some uh, time and I didn't, I, I had been thinking about starting a blog for quite a while, but I didn't want to do it until I had the time to make it a professional thing. And the thing about my job was there would come times of a week or two weeks or a month or two months when I was totally consumed 24 hours a day with it. And so if I had a blog, I would have just dropped it cold with no notice to the readers. It's not going to be around for a while. And and that's not a good way to build up a brand and a, a, and a professional um, operation. But in, in late 2012, I thought I had enough uh, time on my hands that 
that that I could do a blog in a professional way. So that's when I started that. Excellent. Um, I, I when in speaking to various other people who aren't climate scientists, as you know, I, I'm not really sure what that means these days. <laughs> but it's like people were looking at these things, and it doesn't, it didn't seem right, and and so therefore th there was more research that went into trying to understand, you know, exactly what what all this was about, and. Um, and to try and put it into a, a perspective because it there was just this massive onslaught of uh, I don't know any other word to describe it except for propaganda who pushing that this is the, the the big problem and we have these solutions and but the solution um, as I hope we can talk about is this this net zero which has evolved since 2015 in the Paris Agreement and whatnot. Um, and the solution is the death, really, of Western civilization to some extent. So um, I was well, reading. Some recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think they would claim not to have recognized that, although there are many uh, in the movement who actually. Who would like a return to. Um, uh, maybe they would call it a simpler way of life. I mean, uh, in, the way I look at it is that any any political movement is a coalition of a lot of different people. Yeah. And those people may have very different agendas that they're uh, uh, trying to accomplish. So and, and certainly I'm not a part of the global warming alarm movement, so I don't mean terribly to speak for them. But I think that there are a lot of different people in that movement, some of whom generally believe that fossil fuels are ca causing a climate apocalypse. Um, and some of whom uh, uh, the motivation, they, they don't really care about the climate apocalypse at all. It's just a useful meme and what they really want to do is destroy capitalism or civilization. And I think capitalism and civilization are basically synonyms for each other. Um, so there's plenty of people who have that as their goal, I think. I agree. I mean, in my research of the movement is uh, I concur completely that it's this alignment or coalition of various interests and in, in, it's like strange bedfellows to some extent. So there's some, as you say, who want to just bring the system down, others who truly see it that way. But they're all in agreement right now that the biggest blight for moving forward is capitalism and how to get rid of it to some extent is is through this net zero thing. Now, one of the interesting aspects is the the business involvement and the corporate involvement and do you have any thoughts on on why why do you think that the the corporate interests are aligning themselves with this do you think it's maybe they see the momentum and and want to be the first movers and figure they can make something out of this or do you believe that there's others like Brian Monahan maybe who truly believes in it um what's your what's your view of that well again i think everybody might be a little different uh, in their take on this, I I think the two biggest things I think in the corporate world are uh, number one, do we see a profit opportunity? And and there's all kinds of that out there. Government is going to subsidize windmills. Okay, we'll create a company to collect some government subsidies to build windmills and take our money. And because the government is putting up all this money, we can basically claim a fee for ourselves that's completely risk free and just just get rich by our connections with the government. And there's all kinds of that. Uh, but there's and and then there's a lot about we'll create a, a, a ESG fund, right? An economic or a, a environmentalist. Social, social governance and governance fund. And OK, the fees on all our funds have been getting squeezed and squeezed down to about 0.2 percent. Let's create an ESG fund and charge 
half a percent or a full percent. So, so we can <laughs> all get rich by claiming we're investing in something good and nobody will really check up much on that and, you know, and so forth. So there's plenty of money making opportunities. And then, and then the, uh, the other piece I think is that any large company has a franchise to protect. They, they, don't want to have demonstrators outside. They don't want to be accused of despoiling the planet. They don't want to have people lying down in the road to protest them. They, they want they want to somehow claim to be good guys because that will enhance their brand and enhance their sales. They don't want to alienate any potential customer. So, mm-hmm. so there's lots of that too. And I, I my personal belief is there's very little true believing in the higher <laughs> levels of the corporate world, but I, I'm not surprised if there's some true believing in the higher levels of the corporate world. I mean, I don't think Bill Gates's business. And by the way, this is an important point. The smarter people are, and I'm using the word smart in a in a particular way. Uh, But smart, meaning that you will score well on an IQ test, that you will score well on an SAT test, that you will have a you will be a good candidate for admission to an Ivy League school or to be a professor at a fancy college. Those are smart people. They're smart in a particular way. Well, I got news for you. The smarter people are, the more subject they are to being taken in by this kind of a scam. There's no question about it. (laughs) And and so you see people like a Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or what are the names of the heads of, of Google Page and uh, uh, Peachai and so forth. I, I'm not. I'm not. I, I would not hesitate for a minute to think that these people have been taken in and they're true believers because mm. they're so very 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 smart. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but it's true. I don't know where you went to school. I went to very, very fancy schools. And I was surrounded by a lot of very, very smart people. I'm using the word smart in the same sense. The smart in the sense that they got 800s on their SATs. Smart in the sense that they got tremendous IQ scores. They were the valedictorian of their high school and so forth. The the number of these people who were avowed Marxists and proudly proclaimed it. And and when I was in college and law school, both, I was surrounded by these people. And I thought this just couldn't be stupider. And I would have people saying, yeah, but that guy, he's one of the smartest people in the class. He got straight A's. He he got 800s on his law boards. He got this. He got that. And he's an avowed Marxist. And I was like, how could this be? But it is. It is. These are exactly the people who get taken in. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, it's interesting that you say that because these are these business guys would normally do cost benefit analyses. And there's no way the Bank of America or any of these big banks would just throw money at a project that didn't have a really good business plan and would outline um, the potential pitfalls or whatever they would they would require a lot of data before giving them you know a lot of money, and yet here we are these our Western governments have are committing to net zero, and where's the demonstration projects? I know that in your writings you've mentioned a few of these small ones where they've tried really hard in in these nice temperate islands you know where there's a, a small population. And what was the outcome? Well, I'll talk about that in a couple of pieces. First of all, if you talk about Bank of America or J.P. Morgan financing a project, um, yes, they do demand a lot of data. And believe me, the loans they make are getting repaid. So when they make a loan to a windmill project, they make for damn sure that the there's sufficient government subsidies in there. (laughs) <laughs> that this project is going to pay off my loan, no matter whether there's no wind at all, or <laughs> or or how things come out. They 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 might talk a game about net zero, but they're not responsible or doing anything about net zero. All they're doing is financing a government subsidized windmill project that has a guaranteed return. So 
So that's that's piece number one. They, they might be talking a good game about net zero, but it's only the governments that are actually trying to put together an entire economy wide system that might achieve it. As I've written many, many times, it doesn't matter how many windmills you build or how many solar plants you build that will never, ever, ever make a fully functioning 24 seven electrical grid. And the reason is that the wind and solar are intermittent and the, the wind doesn't work when it's calm and the solar doesn't work at night or when it's overcast. And thus, no matter how many of them you build, you have lots of times with no electricity, if that's what is uh, supplying your electricity system. So the banks may be involved in building more and more of these things, but that's never going to get you to net zero. That's a, it's a governments that are supposedly planning a net zero um, economy. But you talked about how bankers demand all kinds of data and proof that this thing can pay off and so forth, which they do. But the governments aren't doing that. The governments are just <laughs> the governments are just putting out some press releases and blather that we're going to get to net zero by such and such a year, or maybe even a statute. We're going to get to net zero by such and such a year, but they don't have a real plan. They don't have a real plan beyond just building more and more wind turbines and solar panels, which is never going to work. Um, now, uh, the, one of the things I've said in my um, blog many times is let's see the demonstration project. Show me the demonstration project. And uh, I think at some point, somewhere or other, I've written about how, how the electricity grid actually got started. This was Thomas Edison's idea. Uh, he had invented thing. He invented the main thing was the light bulb back in the 1870s. The light bulb was already an existing thing. And he recognized that this wasn't going to go very far unless people had electricity at their house. So how are you going to do that? So he proposed demonstration projects. The first one was in London, very small, which I don't know much about because I don't live in London. It was under the Holborn Viaduct. You may know that thing. I don't. Um, but uh, that was immediately followed by another one, which was in lower Manhattan at a spot which I'm very familiar with on Pearl Street in the downtown area. And it was the first electric power station and it burned coal and it um, supplied a handful, like four or five square blocks in the Wall Street area in Manhattan. And he built that and he demonstrated that it worked and that it would be successful. And there's a whole huge history then after that. I mean, Thomas Edison used um, Thomas Edison's facility that he built. The first one used direct current. I, I don't know how much you know about this at all, but direct current has all kinds of problems for being the uh, source of power for an electrical grid. And very quickly, other guys, the most famous one is Nikola Tesla, the guy that Tesla is named after. Yeah. And he was the guy who said, no, 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 you would need this alternating current thing. I mean, that was a huge change in order to make a grid that could be expanded uh, nationwide and uh, into to large scale and so forth. But, but anyway, they started with a demonstration project and they proved that it worked. And, and here we are now going down the road of um, net zero, and there is no such thing as a demonstration project any in the world, anywhere in the world that's gotten even close. And then you asked me to elaborate on this. It's even worse than that, because there are a couple of things which you would think from their early publicity were demonstration projects that have failed miserably. And today, they have websites and you can go and read up on them and read all kinds of happy talk about how many tons of carbon their uh, emissions they're saving. But they're nowhere near net zero. They have no ability to get any closer than they are to net zero. And they just have stopped talking about it like, like, <laughs> oh, what? Uh, it's, it's totally bizarre. So, so the, 
the big one is is uh, an island in in Spain in the Canary Islands called El Hierro, H I E R R O, El Hierro. And uh, it's a small island. It's a volcanic island with very steep hills and mountains. And it has a population of about 10,000. They decided to create a system that consisted of several large windmills. I think it's five or six. But they have sufficient capacity to provide, when the wind is blowing, a multiple of the electricity usage, even the peak electricity usage of that island, like more than double. The capacity of the wind turbines is more than double the peak usage of electricity of that island. And, but they recognize the wind doesn't always blow. And the solution there was we're going to build a pumped water storage facility. So it's it's a reservoir. And what they had on that island was a big volcano. And there's a big volcano crater at the top of it. It's an extinct or dormant volcano. So there's just a big hole. And the idea was we'll line it with concrete. We'll fill it up with water. We'll pump the water up when the wind is blowing, when the electricity use is low. And or even high, because remember, we have capacity if the wind is at full strength and even if everybody's using the electricity they're still produ they're producing double what they need so pump the water up the hill and in the middle of the night if it's windy pump a lot of water up the hill and you have it in the reservoir and then if it's calm during the day you let the water run back down the the volcano goes almost straight up from the ocean so they they built this reservoir it's about 2000 feet up it's like 6, meter, 600 meters or something like that high. It's almost 2,000 feet. Straight up from the ocean, you pump the water up, sits in the reservoir, it goes back down when the, when the wind goes calm. Um, they opened it to great fanfare in, I believe, 2014 with great predictions that they're going to get rid of um, uh, fossil fuels. And by the way, they have a backup diesel generator, which it by itself is completely capable of supplying all the power for the island. Also, when the wind and water system goes dead. And so we're now eight, eight years later and The wind varies. Sometimes they get up to 80 percent of electricity in a month from the wind. But other months, it could be 20 percent. And by the way, and that's not just the wind, but the wind water system. Over the course of a year, they've had a couple of years where they got more than 50 percent of the electricity from the wind water system. But other years, it's below 50 percent. And. And they're not getting they're not getting any closer because building more windmills won't help. What what could help is if they built a, a reservoir big enough. The reservoir is not big enough. Oh, how how much too small is it? Well, the calculations have been done. By the way, the calculations are not complicated. You could do these calculations. They're <laughs> arithmetic. You could do it. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of advanced arithmetic. You have to do hour by hour and day by day and get actual wind data and so forth. But it's just arithmetic. And uh, well, it turns out you would need a reservoir approximately 40 times as big as they have in order to fully back this up. Um, well, they don't have any more uh, mountains. <laughs> Empty <laughs> crater at the top. They used it up. So where, where are you going to put this? There, There is no answer to it, let alone the whole El Hierro model is completely useless for anybody else because where are you going to put where are you going to put a pump storage facility for the UK? They, they actually have one somewhere up in Scotland, I think. But it's, you know, it would back up maybe a tenth of a percent of the entire UK electric usage. And similarly, in, in the there, there are no good sites. There's, there's no place like this. And it would take it would take reservoirs of thousands of square miles and where are you going to build that and who what environmentalist is going to allow an entire state to be of the united states to be covered with a with a reservoir 
for pump storage. It's 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 ridiculous. It, it's never going to happen. So anyway, this is this is what passes for the demonstration project. It's a total abject failure. And the result of it is they put out happy talk about tons of carbon emissions saved. They just completely stopped talking about the fact that they are not successful at getting anywhere near net zero. And everybody else just proceeds along without thinking about it. It's I, I can't understand it at all. I know. And this is also the inherent contradiction in the environmental movement, because on the one hand, they're saying we have to get rid of fossil fuels, but it's the most efficient way of powering our society, that a, a technological modern society of which the, the environmentalists love to use the technology. They just don't want the energy to come from um, from hydrocarbons. And yet, if you look at windmills and solar panels that they're always championing, the land footprint and the material cost and then the environmental damage needed to or what happens to get those materials to make the windmills and solar panels. It's incredible. Like if imagine all the copper that's needed to make all of these windmills that they say the whole world is going to need the the material cost alone and, and the, the process for mining and refining the copper is incredible. And yet all, all of which currently done with fossil fuels. I know it, it, <laughs> There's no explaining this. Tammy, there's no explaining (laughs) it. They are are completely deluded. Uh, They they have bought into a crazed apocalyptic cult, and I I don't know any way of getting them out of it. I know, especially when, okay, so let's let's give the benefit of the doubt and say that, yes, we need to um, do something. Well, the best solution is nuclear for electricity generation in this circumstance. And yet you have most environmentalists haranguing um, the use of nuclear and they go crazy and say, no, we can't expand it. How dare you call that green energy? And there's all kinds of protests and so on. So if it's the one solution, if it's truly about the climate, then you'd think they'd be, uh, you know, jumping on that bandwagon. And yet it, it they don't or very few well, you, do. You would. You would. But I uh, submit to you that the people in this movement mostly think that electricity comes out of a plug in the wall. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's that's how it works. There's a plug in the wall. Electricity comes out of it. And that's all there is to it. Um all of this led me to write uh, an article recently, which you asked me about in this, which which was to say New York and California, don't, <laughs> don't give up. Show us show us how this is done. Um, and California is certainly going down that road. Uh, New York, I'm, I'm completely scratching my head about New York I, and I live in it. Um. They are they're a little bit of a late comer. They in New York, the legislature passed only in 2019. The bill that requires a rapid march to net zero by early dates in the 2030s and complete by the 2040s. Um, and th- that bill created a, various panels and commissions and bodies to give us a scoping plan of how this is going to be done. And the scoping plan only came out this year, earlier this year. (laughs) It's like, it's like 300 pages of um, text and another five or 600 of appendices. So nobody can actually read it. Uh, I've tried to read some substantial parts of it. I, I would tell you they have absolutely no idea what they're doing, just none whatsoever. But they're marching forward, so it's only a it's only a question of how and when they're going to run into a wall. And you might say that, that the right thing for me to do. I mean, I think you you might have had the idea that when I urge them not to quit, that I was being sarcastic. 
But I'm not being sarcastic. I'm being absolutely serious because I, I think the only way that people can people are looking out at seeing their their politicians and people claiming to be scientists and people claiming to be experts saying this can be done. It's only a question of will. You have to go out and do it. And. And then there's a few people like us saying, it can't be done. This is ridiculous. OK, but who are you going to believe? Uh, Tammy Nemeth and Francis Menton or the entire media, all of academia, all of TV, <laughs> all, which all your politicians, which one are you going to believe? So the only way that reality is going to intrude on this is for somebody to push it all the way aggressively and fail disastrously. And even El Hierro doing it doesn't convince anybody because what? Have you ever even read about it or heard about it? It's not in the news. It's nowhere you can be found that can be found. So it's only people like you and I and and a few other people who are skeptical of all of this who actually read and and say, hey, where's the where's the demo project? Oh, you have this. Oh, it doesn't work. OK, you know, but, but the general right. public is unaware. Well, you know, when New York City goes dark. Maybe somebody will figure it out. That's all I could say. But that's what it's going to take. I think that is what it's going to take. And if if New York and California push hard enough, they're going to go dark. I mean, California, I, I, I just can't get over it that they're that they're mandating electric vehicles at the same time as they are closing their nuclear plants. They're closing their coal plants. They're they're they yeah. even. They're closing down their hydroelectric plants, which they have some of them that they use, like in Northern California and Oregon. And they're closing those. What do they think these electric cars are going to run on? I have no idea. No, I, I think, they have no yeah. idea. They believe in magic until reality hits them. And they're going to continue to believe in magic. Unfortunately, it seems that all the Western countries are doing the same disastrous policies all at the same time. So, for example, Canada, like California, has announced that there will be no more internal combustion engine vehicles, new vehicles sold after 2035. And what I find so shocking to some extent, and not shocking, is that the media and the people who ought to be concerned about a government deciding what kind of vehicle is allowed to be built it, that people aren't protesting this. It's like, are we in a capitalist society or not? And clearly not. If a government can come along and just say, well, no, we're going to say no more of those those type of cars anymore. And it's only going to be electric vehicles, but there's not going to be enough electricity. So which then begs the question, is it perhaps the case that not everybody is going to be allowed to have an electric vehicle? Are we going to be like China where they have to have uh, a lottery. You, you have to win the lottery in order to be able to have a license plate for for a vehicle because they don't want everyone to have a vehicle. So is, it, is that the direction that we're hitting? And what I found so fascinating at the UN last week was, you know, Europe's in big trouble with their their faulty energy policies that I mentioned in the introduction. But then China said, hey, why are you giving up on your your green progress? You need to work harder at it. And I thought that was very revealing for China to say that when at the same time they're they're doing record numbers of of new coal plants that are being built. Well, well, I would say that's just extreme cynicism <laughs> on behalf of China to encourage their geopolitical rival, economic rival, to destroy themselves so that China will emerge as the kingpin. Right. I, I don't blame them, but it, it's it's completely <laughs> cynical. Um, <laughs> now, the question of requiring, why isn't anybody protesting against requiring of electric vehicles? Um, well, I would say a couple of things to that. Number one is 
California has. Um, New York actually has. New York has a uh, a law now that prohibits selling non-electric vehicles after X date in the 2030s. You're saying Canada does. But but two things. First of all, the, in the United States, I firmly believe that they cannot prevent you from buying a vehicle in, a, in another state and driving it in. Uh, I know I know a bit about the Supreme Court law on that subject and the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, and I think that that is pretty well established. That doesn't mean that if the Democrats got control of the Supreme Court, that that couldn't be undone for the, you know, to fight apocalyptic climate change. But as of now, I think that's true. And the other thing that I think is true is that the unreality of requiring only electric vehicles will hit home before the 100 percent mandate ever gets here. So. uh well, we'll see if I'm proved wrong on that. I don't think I will be. I think that I, I just I can't see how California can continue on their current path for even a few more years. Now, maybe they can. That's what I say. Yeah, us, I know. Come the demonstration. <laughs> Let them the wall. I know. I, yeah. I want to see it. But, yeah. But and if they can, more power to them. But I don't believe they can. So. So let them try to be the demonstration project. And when they fail, uh, then people will start to learn. So I think that's a better way to get there than by demonstrations. Um, well, well, we'll see. Well, one of the interesting things I, I came across in my research was that um, it was back, I think, in 2018. And Holland was committing itself to become net zero to some extent. And, and they're like, okay, so we're gonna need to build a whole lot more windmills, even though Holland is already really full of windmills and offshore and whatnot. And mm -hmm. so they commissioned an engineering uh, university to uh, one of their departments to do a study, what materials are we going to need? How many are we gonna need so that we can start stockpiling so that we're ready to go when we need to build more windmills and solar panels and whatnot. And the engineering um, department came back with this really great report. And they said, if we take all of the current minerals required to build windmills and solar panels that is currently produced in the world, there won't be enough for Holland, just for Holland to go net zero with, because you have to build, as you mentioned before, you have to build more than your nameplate capacity. You, it, you need at least two, maybe three times as much, maybe. And even then, if you don't have battery backup or other kind of storage, it, it doesn't really matter. And the government said, oh, there's not enough? Okay, then. And they just kind of put that study on the shelf and they didn't... I, I don't know right exactly. Ahead building more windmills. Right? They went ahead building more. And it, what's interesting is that um, the the UK also produced a study. Um, they they were sort of done at the same time, but they didn't. They weren't aware of one another. And the UK study came back and said the same thing. They crunched the numbers. These engineers who were like, "Okay, you've given us this problem to solve. Um, we can't solve it because there's not enough materials. There's not enough minerals." Um, and there's going to be massive competition if the whole Western world goes net zero. We're all going to be fighting each other for these commodities and there's not enough. And so you're basing a lot of the estimates like in, in the UK, they have the Climate Change Committee. They base a lot of their estimates as if prices are never going to increase. But when you have this type of competition going on, they, they're already seeing the prices for these resources, raw materials skyrocketing. And, and then it's dependent on potentially hostile countries like China, who controls, you know, 70 percent of one thing and 80 percent of another, 90 percent of refining of something else. So once again, you know, there's there's these studies out there that's given to government. Government looks at it and says, we don't like that information. We're going to press ahead anyway. And I think that's what's the citizens don't realize, I think, that governments have that information. They've been told it's not going to work, but they're doing it anyway. 
Yes, this this business of how much minerals does it take and can can those really be found and, and processed and acquired at any kind of a reasonable price? That is something that I uh, have steered clear of writing about. It's, it's not that I don't think your points are right. I do think they're right. But but. Uh, let's say predicting the future in those areas is uh, more difficult than others, because now we're talking. It's now we're talking about, for example, lithium. In in order to make a, a world electrical grid fully backed up by lithium batteries, how much lithium would you need? Well, it's multiple hundreds and thousands of times the capacity of lithium mining today. But if the demand is suddenly out there, could the lithium mines be expanded? Uh, could, I mean, lithium is a pretty common element. Um, I, I don't know how much they could be expanded. Could would the cost? I, I would think that if if everybody suddenly had to get a thousand times as much lithium as they have today, and they all needed it in the next five years, that would cause the prices to soar. I would think. But on the other hand, if there was twenty or thirty years, could people find big deposits, and maybe the prices would even come down? Uh, well, then there's the question. I, I've read recently there's a big, a huge new lithium find in Nevada. And guess what? Environmentalists are suing yeah. to block it, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, what kind of supply constraints would be imposed by that kind of thing? So th there are a lot of moving pieces in trying to figure out are trying to predict five or 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, how much lithium you'll be using, how much can you find it? How much is it going to cost? I've tended to steer away from that only because I can't get a, a, a firm handle on numbers that I think are real enough either way. I, I, one of the things that I've written recently, I've, I've written a report on energy storage. It's not yet out, but uh that report considers some just some alternative things in the way of how much lithium batteries cost. Well, first of all, out there, I don't know if you've seen this recently, but just a couple of weeks ago, a group of people at Oxford University. <laughs> oh, you have seen it because you. Yeah, I've seen that. that. Yeah. <laughs> a group of people at Oxford University, one of whom is an old professor and three of whom are research assistants. And and the the lead author appears to be one of the research research assistants. He's like a postdoc at Oxford, and he has written a report saying the world is, can save all kinds of money by going full bore on renewables because the prices are dropping so quickly <laughs> that there this is all going to be much more cheaper than fossil fuels, even. If you need vast amounts of backup from batteries and hydrogen, by the way, their study requires a lot of hydrogen to, to work, but also a lot of batteries. And they predict vast imminent declines in the price of batteries um, of the lithium type, because they don't, Whatever, if, if there's another type that's dramatically better than lithium, it hasn't been invented yet. A lot of people are trying to invent it, but nobody's invented it yet. And I couldn't tell you whether they will or not. But so here's this study predicting vast recent declines. But meanwhile, at the same time, over in another place, New York State, which is trying to go net zero by buying batteries. So New York State has just uh, purchased a lot of batteries or put out purchase orders for large amounts of batteries in the range of multiple gigawatts worth, which sounds like a lot until you realize that they need tens of thousands of gigawatts worth to actually back up their grid. But I think they have now on order six gigawatts worth of batteries. And uh, 
So the, the government, the, the federal government has a report out with a quoted price for batteries, I believe from 2020, lithium ion grid scale batteries, all in, including building the plant, the building, the grid connections and everything, $350 a kilowatt hour. <laughs> um, and they predict that's going to go down to maybe $100 a kilowatt hour over the next few years. But so but New York and they predicted that in 2021. But New York has just placed new purchase orders for batteries and they're paying four and five and six hundred dollars a kilowatt hour for the batteries because there's a crunch on the minerals and all the prices are going up instead of down. Now, which way is this going to go in another year or two or three or five? I don't know. Frankly, if, if I had to put my money on it, I would bet the prices are going to go up, certainly for the next 10 years. After that, who knows? Well, after that, there's probably good. This whole thing will collapse and let, they'll be giving lithium away. <laughs> <laughs> Because well, yeah. they'll have endless amounts of mines and nobody to use this stuff after after people realize it's useless. For sure. Um, and that brings me to your your article where you talk about the levelized cost of energy, because rooted in that study is, you know, by by saying that renewables are just so much cheaper now. Um, I'm wondering if you can help explain what. Um, the levelized cost of electricity, what it means, and if it's a useful metric. Yes, and I, I have gotten some pushback from people I think are smart on my uh, on my writing on that subject. But um, but let's just start with the question of what it what it means to have a levelized cost. And I think the concept at its most general level is a fair one and and in some sense necessary for comparing apples to apples in this world because uh, if you, if you think about creating an electrical grid well it, the, the biggest issue is allocating costs to time periods uh, so and then discounting to the present so that you can compare one way of producing electricity to another and just keep renewables out of it for a second. If you compare nuclear to natural gas in nuclear, the capital cost of building the plant, the upfront cost of building the plant is a huge part of the cost and the fuel is a very small part. In natural gas, the capital cost of building the plant is much smaller and the fuel is much more. So the capital cost comes up front and the fuel comes only as you use the plant. So, so how do you compare the cost of natural gas to nuclear? You have to take, you have to allocate the cost to time periods and you have to discount everything to the present. And I guess that's what they call levelizing the costs. And so th therefore you can compare natural gas to nuclear that way. Now let's talk about the question of renewables. So renewables, well, it's all capital cost. And then there's no fuel cost at all. There's some maintenance cost, but it's very small compared to the capital cost. And you, so you put these things up and you spread the costs over the useful life and discount them in this levelizing thing. And they come up with uh, costs for wind and solar for electricity from wind and solar, which are actually lower than the costs from natural either natural gas plants or nuclear plants, and that has all these people jumping up and down and cheering. Um, well, what did they leave out? What they left out is that the the wind turbines and the solar panels don't produce electricity all the time, so they only produce it at certain times. So, so in fact. Um, and, and by the way, there, there are people who put out these levelized cost studies, and the the famous one is the investment bank Lazard, which must have a huge interest in promoting investments in wind turbines and solar panels. Um, and they put these out, and that that's how they calculate it. But they they totally leave out of the equation the cost of providing the backup or the storage or whatever it takes to make this system work 24 seven. 
It turns out that is far and away the dominant cost of a wind solar electricity system. That's not some minor part of the cost. That's the dominant cost. So they've just left out the dominant cost. And they've, they've compared the cost of a natural gas system that works all the time to a wind and solar system that works only a third of the time or at most a half of the time or 40 percent of the time. Which is like a third world power system that 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 goes out <laughs> three or four days a week, and it only works when it feels like it. Um. Now, so how about if you add in the cost of the backup or the storage or whatever it takes? Now, then you have to make all kinds of assumptions on what you're going to use for backup or storage. You know, for example, you could use natural gas as the backup for <laughs> wind and solar. Well, if you do that, then the cost of the natural gas system is the cost of the natural gas system. But you need the entire natural gas system to back up the wind and solar. You can't have a natural gas system that can only supply half the electricity because the wind and solar can be completely dead, 100 percent dead. On a calm night, you get nothing. So you need the entire natural gas system. So, so wind and solar backed up for natural gas costs the same cost for the wind and solar plus the plus the cost for the natural gas. <laughs> you, you do save you do save uh, the fuel for when the wind and solar are operating, but it turns out that the savings there are not nearly as much as the cost of adding the wind and solar system. So that, and, and that's the cheapest backup, but and by that backup, you'll never get to 50% of your power from the wind and solar, never. And how are you gonna get your wind and solar to 100 or close to it? By the way, if you could get your wind and solar to 90% or 95%, how much of the natural gas system do you still need? All of it, you need all of it. You can't get rid of any of it. No matter, it doesn't matter if you build wind and solar to a thousand times the capacity of peak, peak usage, you need 100% backup. You need an entire additional system which could do the whole job without any wind and solar. So, and that's part of the cost of the wind and solar system. Now, so when they do a calculation of a levelized cost of electricity, they always leave that out. Now, to be fair, when I said that somebody is pushing back on me, they're pushing back on me to say, I'm not really challenging the concept of levelization. I'm just challenging the particular people have done it wrong. OK, but if, if you read about levelized cost of electricity anywhere other than at the Manhattan Contrarian blog, it will be done wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess I'm just alerting everybody to that very simple fact. Well, that's a very important point that um, it matters what data that you're using in order to make your levelized cost analysis. So, as you say, if you're not including the backup and you're not including um, these these other elements like does how long does it last? Uh, what's the recycling cost afterwards? How do you dispose of it? Um, I, I think the that, question of how long does it last, it, fairly speaking, is included in levelized costs like from Lazard. OK, I, but, how but even so, you still need all the backup. It makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, the, the backup is what's missing. The backup yeah. is what's missing. And the, how do you dispose of it? Uh, I think if you look at their and, and they do provide, you know, they put out big reports and they do provide some detail on how they make the calculation. And I think they have something in there for uh, disposing of it. Now that I'm, I strongly suspect that what they have in there for disposing of it could be highly criticized. I haven't taken the time to do that, but I think they do have something for disposing of it. I think they do account for or purport to account for how long it lasts. But what they don't account for is the, the backup or the storage to get to 100 percent. And that that is far and away the dominant cost of the system if you're trying to get to net zero. Well, I think one of the to sort of bring this around to what's going on in Europe, 
Germany has been trying to do this since 2010. And they built windmills all over the place. They've got solar panels on many houses in, in the towns and cities. They had a, a huge subsidy program uh, for people to install solar panels on their roof for heating their water and so on and so forth. Um, so they've had 12 years where, and the Germans with their German efficiency, you know, they put all this stuff <laughs> in and, and everything else. And yet they were still reliant on natural gas. They're still reliant on their coal-fired plants, particularly after Fukushima, and they started to retire um, their nuclear power plants. So with all that being said, here they've, they've tried it. It's clearly not working. And some would say perhaps, and, and, and you've written about this to some extent, that um, the current energy crisis facing Europe is self-inflicted. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, it's totally self-inflicted. So, so what has happened in Germany? And I find this completely unbelievable. It, it, Germany has uh, gone down a road of building more and more and more uh, wind turbines and solar panels. Germany is the cloudiest country in the world. I've actually seen <laughs> statistics for that. It's the cloudiest country in the world. The, the, the idea, if you think Germans are smart, they, they have the idea that it makes sense to build solar panels in the cloudiest country in the world. In California, they get 25 percent, almost 25 percent capacity factor on an annualized basis out of solar panels in the desert. In Germany... <laughs> Their capacity factor is around 11 <laughs> percent. It's, it's a joke. <laughs> but um, even 25 percent is a joke. But 25 percent means basically when the sun is up, you're getting electricity from the panels. Um, they build more and more and more. The, the nameplate capacity factors that they have for wind and solar put together are far, far more than their peak usage. And there are plenty of times in the year when they get 100% of their electricity from wind and solar. And in fact, they have excess. And now what the hell are you gonna do with the excess? And what happens because they have dispatch priority for the wind and solar and everything else gets squeezed off the grid is is that the, the they have a spot market for power. It turns negative and they have to pay Poland to take the power. So. Yeah. So this is where Germany has gotten itself, and they have built almost no storage, o almost none. I mean, the, the amount of storage that they've built, and I have that in I have that in my upcoming energy storage paper that's going to come out soon. But the amount of storage that they've built is something on the order of 0.1 or 0.2 percent, 0.1 percent of what they would need to fully back up their wind solar system without fossil fuels or nuclear. A, a, fra a small fraction of 1%. They would need to build something like a thousand times more. And and then, then they talk about, we, we, we got a big program, we're gonna buy much more storage and when you, we're gonna multi, we're gonna increase it to a factor of 20. I mean, you look at it and you realize by increasing it to by a factor of 20, there's still gonna be less than 1% of what they need. So, um, the arithmetic to figure this out is not complicated. Uh, yes, you can't do it in your head, and it's even difficult to do by hand on pieces of paper because it takes it says a lot of numbers, and you need hourly data, and you have to add up a lot of stuff. And you'd be well advised to use a spreadsheet. But it, anybody who knows how to do spreadsheets, which I'm not very good at, but if you know how to do spreadsheets, you could do all this arithmetic in a day. And somehow Germany hasn't figured it out. So, again, they're, they're just going to have to learn the hard way. <laughs> well, I think their, their manufacturers are and their factories are learning this because they're shutting down. There's a, a steel plant in Bremen that has said it has to shut its doors because natural gas and energy is too expensive. And um, there was another aluminum plant that had to shut down. They could and they could have their they could have their entire industrial sector closed down for the winter, and uh, and I'm wondering how much of it is going to reopen in the in the spring. Exactly, I, I and know. 
and at the same time, their their imports of steel and aluminum um, has increased by, I don't know, a factor of two or three from China. So <laughs> they're not producing it themselves anymore. And China's not using, uh, using electricity from coal. And why wouldn't they? Or from cheap natural gas from Russia. So they're doing this in order to punish Russia because they don't want to use Russian natural gas um, to to manufacture these things. But then they're importing it from China. That's getting a great deal for you know natural gas from Russia. So it's very, very strange and, and, and seems rather contradictory and, and devastating for for the German economy. And Ursula von der Leyen, in, in her speech last week, her European State of the Union speech, she actually came out and said that the whole problem is that they're reliant on fossil fuels. And it's been the problem all along. They should have learned from the first energy crisis in the 70s. And therefore, they need to learn that lesson now and stop using fossil fuels altogether. It just was just build more wind turbines and solar panels. You see, I know and, it was bizarre. I bet you. <laughs> I'll bet you that the the lovely Ursula uh, got top SAT scores or whatever the European equivalent of that is and was a top student at the university. And she is a very, quote unquote, smart person. And she just can't be troubled to do any basic arithmetic. Because <laughs> <laughs> all the people around her have told her just build more solar panels and wind turbines. That's it. Well, I find it interesting that the that the UK is taking a bit of a different um, stance on this because the oh, European I countries. Mean, I mean, as of as of a week ago. Oh, as of a week ago, exactly. So, but I mean, for the UK to have turned like that is significant. I don't know if they'll be able to follow through. For example, they had approved back in I think it was March or April after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They approved a a new field by Shell in the North Sea that had been rejected for because they didn't take into account the effects of climate change down the road or something. And so they reversed that decision and approved it. And in August, Greenpeace filed a lawsuit to stop the approval. So whether or not actually it. anything comes out of it, you know, they can well, make these policy declarations. But similarly, the new environmental minister, Jacob Rees-Mogg, right? Yes. You, you live in the UK, but so Jacob Rees-Mogg has just um, uh, an, announced the lifting of the ban on fracking, but, which is a step, but that doesn't mean that anybody has actually drilled a well yet. I'm, I'm sure they have to get through permitting and lawsuits and I don't know what before they actually have any significant amount of energy produced by this uh, fracking, but it's a start. Now, meanwhile, also, and again, you're in the UK, but I am the president of the American Friends of the Global Warming Policy Foundations, and that's a British-based group, so I'm a little bit tied in, but I, I am informed that um, among the Tory majority in the parliament, uh, Half or close to half are what's called the Green Tories or something like that, that, yeah. that are completely on board with the net zero thing. And they are certainly a significant enough block that the Tories don't have a majority without them. So uh, how quickly the UK is going to be able to move on this? Uh, r remains to be seen. I think that I think that Liz Truss has got her head in the right place. I think that Jacob Rees Mogg has got his head in the right place. But there's all kinds of forces aligned against them. So we'll see. We'll see for sure. I, you, you're absolutely right. There's there's various potential roadblocks there from within their own caucus. I suppose is how you could describe it. And and with the the Climate Change Committee, which is this sort of quasi government non-governmental organization that advises the government, and, and they're filled with radicals, really. Um, Crazies. They're, 
They're really crazy. crazy. Yeah. I've read some of their reports and it's just mind boggling. Um, So (laughs) I don't know. But so with respect to geopolitics, do you think that this European energy transition that they've been trying to do since 2010, do you think that had a significant impact or influence on Russia's decision to attack Ukraine? Um, I don't have a good answer for that. I would say it probably had some influence, but but uh, I really have just lost any uh, admiration. I'm not saying I ever had any admiration, but whatever. I I used to think that Putin was a. Uh, even though I didn't like him, I thought he was a clever guy playing a bad hand pretty well on the world stage. I, I don't think that anymore. I now think that he is uh, way too clever by half and is driving Russia into the ground. So, mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, it's a tricky one for sure. So. So would he have invaded Ukraine if he didn't have uh, Europe kind of over the barrel? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, 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 it certainly didn't help that he had Europe over the battle, I'm, uh, barrel. I'm sure he realized he had Europe over the barrel. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Especially knowing how more and more increased dependence on Russian natural gas, especially when Nord Stream 2 was about to open, which was incredible, to say the least, that that Europe would try to tie itself even further to Russia. But yeah, well, that was that was Angela Merkel's fault. (laughs) And Um, Gerhard Schroeder's to some extent. I guess. Yeah. Now, do you think the world is a safer place if Western countries pursue net zero? Oh, totally the opposite, of course. I mean, I I, I think people are horrible and violent, and and the history of humanity is a history of violence and warfare. And the only reason we don't have it everywhere all the time right now is that the U.S. military prevents it. And then we're in the business right now of undermining the U.S. military. So the good news, uh, Tammy, you sound I don't know how old you are. I suspect you're younger than me. I I, I won't be around when the whole world falls apart into World War Four. <laughs> 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 um, but. Yeah, the, the 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 elites today have have no idea how we got here and why we're successful. They have no idea. They think electricity comes out of the wall. They think humans are naturally peaceful creatures, and and all we have to do is is just um, be nice to each other and all get along, and and end the systems of oppression and capitalism that have previously oppressed us and everything will be fine. They have no idea. So they, I, I firmly believe that they will destroy things. I, I feel bad for my uh, grandchildren. You might, you might hear crying in the background. <laughs> well, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. I know it's getting on past an hour now and I really appreciate your your time and the thought you've put into your research and just the clarity in which you you make your arguments and it's you know rooted in actually thinking about things crunching numbers and not just sort of wishful thinking so thank you for that thank you so much thank you for having me it's been a pleasure thank you <laughs> <laughs>